This is the all new Peugeot 308 GT Premium Wagon and it's just landed in Australia. Now I've spent a week with this car but I have to tell you that from the get go I've been really drawn to it and here's why. Of course it's a small wagon and as untrendy as that might be it does bring SUV like practicality to a package that many people will find more appealing. Secondly it's longer and roomier than the 308 hatchback that we reviewed recently and spoiler alert we gave that an 8.5 out of 10. What really bodes well for this wagon version is that 8 out of 10 was a lot to do with the driving experience. And thirdly, it's French, and with that comes a certain expectation of flair and style. So that's where we're going to start. Chasing cars. Honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. With its fetching green paintwork and its shadow grey highlights, the 308 GT Premium Wagon certainly looks upmarket. So it's premium by name, and if appearances are anything to go by, premium by nature. What backs this up is that the single variant trim offered is fully loaded. Price? Well, it kicks off from 50,490 list, or a little over 55 grand drive away. So fully loaded means that Peugeot really does load in everything into this car, including this example, which gets standard fit paint called Avatar Blue, although it's green. Some of the Chasing Cars crew thinks that the 308 wagon is absolutely gorgeous, and I must agree, particularly front on. It's very striking nose on, including this ornate grille and LED matrix headlights. Right, let's check out the rear. The rear is a combination of fancy curves and edges, and you do get these rather wonderful LED three-dimensional taillights, though the tailpipe outlets are fake. Side on though, I don't think it's quite so fetching. It's over 4.6 metres long, so it's very long indeed. And in fact, if it was an SUV, it'd be categorically mid-size. It's actually 55 millimetres longer in wheelbase than the hatchback version, but it's really these big overhangs at the front and at the rear that make it look so long and so French. So it does look long and very sleek, and part of that is because the roof line is actually lower than that of the hatchback. But you do get a lot of metal in the side of the door and not a lot of character line and in turn that makes these 18 inch wheels look a little bit undersized. Right, so Peugeot wants to be considered as a premium brand and I must say the 308 makes its strongest pitch inside as a premium offering. It's certainly richer and more sumptuous in here than what you might find in a Volkswagen Golf. Even really expensive and fast Volkswagen Golfs that want for a lot more money. The material use is excellent, including full grain Nappa leather trim, Alcantara inserts in the doors and this very fetching green stitching. And there's a real suppleness and tactility to everywhere that you touch. It's minted in this really angular theme in this dark brooding colour scheme and both work together to good effect. The quality of the switch gear is also very top notch, particularly some of the controls here along the centre console and some extra neat little touches such as a separate inductive phone charging pad and a different cubby if you do have your phone wired. Big cup holders, large center bin storage, it really is quite a convenient cabin space. So far so good, but we're about to take a turn for the worse. Let's deal with the elephant in the room here, the instrumentation. Some time ago, Peugeot decided as its point of difference to locate the instrumentation above the steering wheel rather than viewing it through the steering wheel. And it's crap, because if you locate the wheel in its normal position, like normal people do, you can't see the instruments through the top of the steering wheel. Sure, you could probably lean forward and peer to the rather excellent 3D instrumentation, but in any normal position, you can't see information such as the speedometer, which is kind of important, right? In truth, it's pretty funky, and some people will actually like this, but for others, it really will be a deal breaker. Also, the two-spoke wheel is strangely small and unusually egg-shaped, but some people might like that, each to their own. Let's get back to the good stuff. The seats are fantastic, very comfy, heated, although not cooled, and you do get massage function, which is really good for a vehicle this price. You also get what Peugeot calls a clean cabin air treatment system and customizable LED mood lighting in the doors. The new 10-inch infotainment touchscreen brings a whole new format and it's fast acting and very intuitive to use then the 360 degree camera system is excellent. You also get this handy secondary touchscreen for certain vehicle functions, though strangely, they've also included some physical buttons underneath for other functions. Go figure. Right, so far so good up front, let's check out row two. One of our criticisms of the 308 hatchback was that in the second row, room was pretty cramped, and despite that extra 55 millimeters of wheelbase, I've gotta say, it's pretty much the same here with the longer wagon. 
The seats look great, but aren't really that comfortable. And the panoramic roof doesn't extend all the way back. So it is a little bit claustrophobic here. But you do get some nice appointments such as dual rear air vents and dual USB-C ports. Though there is no fold down armrest, so you don't get cup holders as a four seater. You do get a handy motion sensor power tailgate. And once it's open, you can see why the second row room is so rubbish. The boot space is a whopping 608 litres, which is a lot bigger than a lot of small SUVs and bigger than some medium-sized SUVs. Better still, when you stow the second row, the floor becomes almost completely flat, which is a trick that the hatchback can't do, liberating 1,634 litres. You can tilt the floor as well. And there's also a storage space under there that's big enough for a space saver, though Peugeot hasn't fitted one. Practical? You bet, as long as you don't get adults who are too large in the second row. Right, let's take it for a drive and see how it goes. For my money, the 308 GT Premium Wagon looks fast standing still, but if you're hoping for that old 308 GTI-like performance, be prepared to be disappointed. There's currently no spicy 308 GTI hatchback offered by Peugeot, and that extends through to the wagon. Power comes from a 1.2-litre three-cylinder turbocharged petrol engine, and I know what you're thinking, that sounds a little bit underbaked to haul around a wagon. In truth, the little three-cylinder engine does have a fair bit of character, but with 96 kilowatts and 230 newton meters, there's really not a lot of shove. That might prove to be a pretty fun engine if you shoehorned it into the hatchback one up, and with the manual gearbox that's offered overseas. But here in the larger wagon, backed by an eight-speed auto and probably many loved ones on board, it's merely adequate. Get it on boil and there's a nice torque hump in the mid-range, but really, if it deviates either side of that, it really kind of falls off the boil. But it does demand a bit of patience for overtaking if you just want to trounce on the loud pedal. But what you trade in performance, you do gain in frugality. So the combined claim is 6.1 litres combined, and that can drop to around the four litre mark out on the highway. Still, no matter how it feels, it is by the stopwatch categorically slow. It just scrapes into single figures with a 9.9 second zero to 100 km an hour claim. It can drop the refinement ball a little bit around town because at low speed, the powertrain can get quite grumpy. And at a crawl, the brace can just become annoyingly bitey. But for its size, this wagon is incredibly lightweight. Its tar figure is just 1,314 kilos. And this bodes well for its dynamic capabilities. It's underpinned by the rather excellent EMP2 platform that is also under the hatch and that Peugeot has been using for quite a while. And although it has a torsion beam rear end, it's really how the suspension is tuned that determines the quality of the drive. And what this wagon delivers is pretty impressive. Ride and handling is quite impressively good. It is very refined and polished. The longer wheelbase might mean that it's not quite as nimble as its hatchback stablemate, although it still is quite an engaging thing to drive, particularly once you up the enthusiasm. There's really good grip from these Michelins and the feel through the tiny steering wheel is direct and quite communicative. Peugeot has also loaded the wagon in with plenty of safety, so you get AEB with pedestrian and cyclist detection, active lane keeping and rear cross traffic alert, although it has not been rated yet by ANCAP. All in all, it really is butte on road, even if it's not as enthusiastic as its sporting styling suggests. Next up is ownership, and let's start with fuel economy. As mentioned, the combined claim is a little over six litres per hundred, though you do have to work that little turbo triple fairly hard at times, and we've seen figures as high as mid eights. It also requires premium fuel. Servicing, though, is pretty handy, and a prepaid package for five years costs $1,800. And Peugeot's warranty is a fairly standard five-year unlimited kilometre terms. Let's face it, the new Peugeot 308 GT Premium's mid-50s price on road is starting to get up there. That said, it really does present itself as a premium machine and there's plenty of depth and quality to much of the experience. But if there's a barrier to entry for some prospective buyers is that a wagon that wants for this much dough is only powered by a small three-pot turbo engine. Especially when rivals such as Skoda's Octavia offer a lot more output and larger capacity for roughly similar dough. Still, the Peugeot offers a generally fine driving experience and with a package that does offer a genuine alternative to the Me Too SUV set. It does trade performance for frugality, but there's still plenty of sporty clip in its manner. So that's what I think, but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe while you're at it. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.